Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's time for us to begin our worship services. It's always hard to stop when, uh, when you're visiting and fellowshipping with each other, but since we are broadcasting this, we need to go ahead and, and get started. So I want to thank everybody for being here this morning. It's, it's great to see so many of you here in the building, and thanks for joining us in other ways that you're joining us, either in the parking lot or online, but it's good to have everyone here. Uh, we have some visitors with us. We're pleased to have you with us as well. You are bless us by your appearance here, and we hope that you find our worship services encouraging. And for our members, we hope you find them edifying as well. In addition to those that are listed for need of prayers in our bulletin that are either sick or are shut in and confined to home, we have the following updates. Uh, Mary Thompson, Brenda's Estes' mother, is home from the hospital and on antibiotics and and pain medicines. Uh, we have an update on Rhonda Ray, Jason Mullinax's cousin. She's completed all her cancer treatments, and her last tests have revealed that she's cancer-free at this time, so that's good news. Glad to hear that. Uh, Marilyn Notgrass will be having outpatient surgery this Tuesday, and also has some good news. I just was informed that Roman and Julie are expecting another child this October, which has great news. So Dex will be a big brother. Uh, Julie's a little bit under the weather, so let's remember to keep that family in our prayers. Uh, and congratulations to the grandparents, Russ and Michelle Edlin, and great-grandparents, Larry and Alberta Edlin, on the birth of Charlie Elizabeth, who was born April 7th to John and Lindsay Ayers in Fayetteville, North Carolina. All are doing well, including Auntie Ashley uh, Edlin. So let's, let's continue to remember all of them in our prayers as well. This morning, uh, immediately following our worship services, the young ladies will be practicing their song leading in the auditorium. Uh, all the ladies are, are welcome to join. Any young ladies wanting to participate in the service needs to let Michelle know. Uh, request uh, for our men that we... Uh, we leave the building, I leave the auditorium as soon as we can after our closing prayer so that that work might uh, begin. Our food pantry uh, item for this week is breakfast cereal. Uh, a couple of announcements. One is the elders and deacons meeting. Uh, we're going to have an elders and deacons meeting next on April 25th. We'll, we'll let you know the timing of that soon, but just want to let you know that, that that's in plan, an elders and deacons meeting for April 25th. And also as a reminder, our gospel meeting is just a month away, May 16th through the 19th with uh, Brother Gary Hampton. Uh, he's going to be presenting lessons from Philippians. It's kind of the culmination of our, our study of faith, hope, and love. So we look forward to that as well. In terms of other congregations, Arnold Church of Christ gospel meeting starts today going through Wednesday, April 14th. Services are at 7 on Monday through Wednesday. The speaker is Tyler Young on the Christian and the culture. Services will also be live streamed there if you're interested in looking at them from YouTube on their Facebook page. The Ladies' Day at, at Greenmount Road Church of Christ is May 1st. The speaker is Evelyn Bonner on the topic of Rejoice Always. Please sign up by next Sunday, April the 21st. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin if you ladies plan to participate in that. There's other information we've seen relative to our mission efforts and you can find those on the bulletin as well on the bulletin board as well in the foyer as we begin our worship services just a reminder please silence your mobile devices that that our worship might not be interrupted by that this morning the scripture reading will be judges 11 verses 1 through 8 so if you'd like to mark that in your bibles at this time judges 11 verses 1 through 8 uh, Ethan Landrum will be reading to us at the appropriate time from God's Word. Our opening prayer will be Brother Del Kruger. The Lord's table will be handled by Brother Don Atchison. The closing prayer by Brother David Estes. And the lesson of the hour this morning will be brought to us by Brother Matt Haynes. We'll now begin our, our worship service and song, and we'll be led in singing by Brother Andy Basford. So let's turn our thoughts and minds toward our worship service. Let us begin our worship in song this morning by singing number 468, 
Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, number 468. Might look a little unfamiliar because it's been a while since we sang it, but it is sung to the same tune as I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, so hopefully that will help some. Number 468. Mm-hmm. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood avails for me. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all and blessed eternally. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works <clears throat> praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all and blessed eternally. Brother Dale Kruger will lead us in prayer. Brother Ethan Landrum will read to us from God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have poured upon us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to allow us once again to assemble and worship you on this first day of the week. Father, it's our prayer that this worship be acceptable in your sight. Father, we ask that you be with those who are mentioned in the sick. Father, be with those who take care of their needs. And Father, we pray on the behalf of those who are recovering from sicknesses and, and injuries. Father, we are mindful of those who are shut in and unable to be with us because of their health and their age. Father, we ask that you be with us as we go about our daily lives. Father, help us to be an example to the world that is lost. Father, help us to grow in our love towards you. Father, help us to be more desirous of of being faithful to you in our lives so that that example that we show to others will be true. Father, we're so thankful for your son and for you and the plan of salvation that you extended to mankind. Father, the the death on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Father, we pray that as we 
to worship you, that our minds may be directed towards the greatness of, of you, the creator. And Father, we see your beauty and, and see the, the beauty that you've given us here on this earth to have confidence in you. Father, we thank you for the changing of the seasons. Father, we ask that you be with this country that we live in. Father, we're very thankful for the country that we live in, the freedoms that we have, the, the ability to assemble ourselves together upon this first day of the week. Father, we pray that you be with our leaders and, and give them guidance. And Father, we pray that they would seek guidance from you. Father, we pray for those who are not as fortunate as we are. Father, we pray that they will be in obedience to you even though they may have to endure persecution knowing that that, that be for just a moment and the glory of being able to spend an eternity with heaven. Father, we ask that you be with each of the families represented here this morning. Father, we pray that you be with the parents of those who have young. Father, we pray that the, the guidance that they may see the importance of bringing their children up to follow after you. Father, be with us as grandparents that our example be true also. Father, we pray for the eldership here at West End. Father, help us to lead the congregation in a way that you would want the congregation led. Father, we're thankful for the deacons as they labor on behalf of the congregation, for our song leaders, for the membership, that we encourage each other through this life with the joy and happiness of knowing that we are children of yours. Father, we pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. The scripture reading this morning will be from Judges 11, verses 1 through 8. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead begot Japheth. Gilead's wife bore sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall have no inheritance in our father's house, for you the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and dwelt in the land of Tob, and worthless men branded together with Jephthah and went out raiding with him. It came to pass after a time that the people of Ammon made war against Israel. And so it was, when the people of Ammon made war against Israel, that the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our commander, so that we may fight against the people of Ammon. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Do you not hate me and expel me from my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the people of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. To help prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper, let us sing number 734, Were You There? Number 734. Sing the first four verses. <clears throat> Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, 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 sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, 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 oh. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there 
when the sun refused to shine. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, 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 sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, 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 oh. sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? We assembled here this morning on this first day of the week to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He established this memorial feast the night that he was betrayed, and he had very specific instructions for our memorial feast that we're going to celebrate now. He had the unleavened bread, and he had the fruit of the vine, and he told us then that the bread represents his body and the fruit of the vine, his shed blood. So as we remember that sacrifice, let us be thankful for his willingness to suffer and die for us. Let us pray. Our Father God, we come before you now, praising you and thanking you for sending your Son to suffer the humiliation, the separation, the, sep uh, the humiliation, the separation from you as he sacrificed his body on the cross for us in our sin. Be with each and every one of us now. We pray that we will examine ourselves and that we will take this emblem in the manner in which we should. Be with us now and bless each one. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Our Father, we come before you again thanking you for the blood that your son shed on the cross, the blood that allows us cleansing from our sin and acceptance in your sight. Father, be with us all as we partake of this. And again, may we do this in a manner pleasing in your sight. We ask this in all things in the name of your Son and our Savior. Amen.
We now have an opportunity to return a portion of the bounty that we've been blessed with back to, back to the Lord for the furtherance of his work in this area and throughout the world. If you're at home, you can mail your check to the church at 3815 Old Highway 94. And then if you're here, there's a receptacle in the foyer and then also under the carport. Let's give thanks. Father, we thank you for the abundance that we have. We thank you for being blessed to live in the most prosperous nation ever to be established in by man. We thank you, Father, for the ability to earn a living. And Father, we pray that each and every one of us will have a heart to share that bounty that you've blessed us with. We pray, God, for our leaders, for our elders, as they make decisions on how to best distribute and use these funds. Be with them and be with each and every one of us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the lesson of the hour, let us sing number 977, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, number 977. If it is convenient, please stand for this song as well. <clears throat> In heavenly armor we'll enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Be seated, please. Song of invitation will be number 760, Who Will Follow Jesus, number 760. Now to bring us the lesson of the hour, Brother Matt Haynes. Joe, my monitor, here is, thank you, brother. I'm going to talk about that, too. Joe's going to get talked about for that one. I want to give you guys an update on how this weekend went. Uh, we hosted the Arch Youth Conference, which we normally do that in January. We don't always host that. It rotates from congregation to congregation around the St. Louis area. This was our year to host that. And it was supposed to be in January. Obviously, with COVID, the way that it was, we decided to move that to April. And we didn't really know exactly what to expect, um, how many people were going to travel, how many people's comfort level would be. So when I talked to Jamie Barnes, who is the director of the Arts Youth Conference, he attends at the St. Peter's Congregation, we didn't know if we would have five people or 100 people. We just weren't sure. 
So on Friday evening, we had 68 people from seven different congregations, and two of those folks came from, one was from Alabama, which is the Bonds, they don't count, just joking. We're happy to have them. And the second was a young lady from Texas who used to live at the Collinsville Church of Christ, that's where she attended, and she was up here. So we were just extremely excited to have everybody. Joe Wells came in and presented some very fine lessons, and then on Saturday we had about 50 people. So it got to be about last week around Tuesday or Wednesday. Jamie reached out to me and said, Joe Wells has got a PowerPoint presentation, um, and Ben Jackson is going to be leading singing, and we have PowerPoint. Uh, do we have you know, people that can do that? And I immediately started to panic a little bit because I hadn't re reached out to Joe. That's why he's getting talked to. I didn't reach out to Joe or Jeff, so I sent a group text to them saying, hey, guys, is there any way that you can be there? And Jeff couldn't make it because of work. And Joe's like, yeah, I think I, I can make it. So he made it, and I decided it was probably good for me to be back in the AV booth with Joe. And let's just say I am so thankful that Joe was there. There are too many buttons and switches back there. Why? Why is there not just a power on switch and a power off switch? There's not. It looks like we're at NASA, and I'm getting ready to shoot off a missile or something. It's the craziest thing. So I'm, I'm back there, and Joe said, hey, would you like to run the PowerPoint for the songs? And I immediately was like, no. No, I don't want to do that at all. But what have I been preaching, right? So I'm like, yes, Joe. So I move over, and I mean, I was in a sweat. I was nervous. If Joe were not there, I would have been balled up in the fetal position underneath the table, scared to death. So Joe, thank you so much. I want to thank the Karens as well, Chad and Carissa. Right at the conclusion of the conference, they were able to, to come into the building and sanitize the building and get it clean for everybody for Sunday. So very thankful for all the work that went into that. Joe was definitely Andy Griffith. I'll give you one guess who I was. I was the shaky deputy Barney Fife. But we made it through. So thank you so much. We are studying... A series of lessons in living in faith, hope, and love. That's our theme right now at the West End Congregation as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, living in faith, hope, and love. These three may abound, but we continue in these things. Now, as we're doing that, we're looking at the book of Hebrews and we're trying to gather some lessons from Hebrews to help us in that task of how we can properly live a life of Christians in faith, hope, and love. And what we notice is the Hebrew writer mentions the name of six men in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. In that one verse, there are six men's names that are mentioned. Now, he mentions this. The time would fail me, or I don't have the time to even go into these men. Now, he didn't by some way start to say that these guys don't matter, right? Right? He's basically saying there are so many situations of faithfulness that I don't even have the opportunity, the time to go into these guys. So we are taking the time over the next few weeks to evaluate some of these men. And two weeks ago, we talked about Gideon, took some points away on how valuable it is for us to take the time to think about Gideon and the life that he lived. Well, this morning, we're going to look at another one of those men. We're going to evaluate the life of a man named Jephthah. Now, Jephthah is a fantastic study. If you all haven't done it, we're going to do that this morning, and I hope you're, going to, you're able to, to gain some valuable insight in his life and how that can relate to us in living a life of faith, hope, and love. So we're going to look at four points this morning on Jephthah as we take the time and what he shows us. The first thing that he shows us in Judges chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, is this. Value changes in the eyes of men. Now, if, if you listen to the scripture reading this morning, what we notice is that Jephthah was a mighty man of valor. In other words, he was a warrior. He was a man of some strength and some might, and they were described in the Bible as being a mighty man. But he was the son of a harlot. His dad was Gideon, and his wife, he had, they had sons. And those sons did not like Jephthah because they didn't want Jephthah to get the inheritance that came to them through their mother. That, they, that's our mother. You're the son of a harlot of our father. So what did they do? They ran him out. 
What was his value in the eyes of his brothers? We got no time for you. We don't care about you. There is zero value or worth in you. So what did Jephthah do? He was ran out of his land, and he went to the land of Tob. And there he had what the Bible describes as vain, profane, or worthless men associated with him. They gathered with him, and they would raid together. So they were his cohorts. So isn't it interesting that the people of God didn't have time for him, but who always has time for an outcast? The world, right? Those that we would describe as being worthless, they certainly had the time to be there with him. Well, so he, he had no value, no importance, no significance until, verse 4, the transition. Ammon is coming into Israel, to these Israelites, to Gilead, to fight them. And immediately, that person who had zero value and significance and importance, we don't want you here, you're going to take our inheritance away, get out of here. Now this man, all of a sudden, his mother doesn't matter. Hey, I know your mom was a harlot, that really mattered a lot to us before, but you know what, now we could care less about that. We're going to die and we need you to protect us. Is that amazing how we can see people change in regards to their value of what they think? Now, Jephthah's response would have been very similar, I would think, to any of us. Wait a minute, guys. You ran me out. You hated me. And now you're saying not only you want me to come back, but you want me to be your leader in your head? Is, am I hearing you right? Yes, that's why we came to you. So Jephthah decides that he will, I'm going to do this. Jephthah shows us a lot of value in him. However, we didn't necessarily see that in them until there was something they could get out of Jephthah. Now, brethren, here's the important point for us. What is our value for souls? What's our value for people? Do we look at people and say, you're valuable to me, if I can find something that you can do for me that is of value. Make sense? You're valuable to me as long as I find something in you that gives me some sort of value. That is not the way that we should look at people. We want to try to program ourselves to the when we look at people, our value is not ascribed to them based on what they can give us, but we try to look through the lens of what Christ saw people. And he valued people so much, did he not? He looked at the sinner. He looked at the lame and the paralyzed. He looked at those that were the outcast on the outskirts of society, maybe like that of Jephthah, right? That were cast aside and we got no time for you, no need for you. And those are the ones that Jesus had love and compassion for. Brethren, when we look at people, we have to have value for them. When we look at people, we need to strive to the best of our ability to look at them the way God looked at them. John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. Who is that? That's us Christians. That's us who have got some strong moral character value. We're the same mind and the same judgment, and God came and he died on the cross for us. But you know what else? He died for the world. Not just those that are here this morning. Those that are contrary to God, those that are trying to get rid of anything that is good and right, those that stand against things that God stands for, those that are trying to say, God did not create them male and female, but God has actually made, maybe made a mistake if there's a God. I am a female. I should be a female. God died for those people, and they have value as well. Even those ones that we might say, you really irk me, you really irritate me, you really frustrate me. What is their value? So much that Jesus went to the cross for them. Don't forget that. Don't look at those people, those outskirts of society, those that are actually trying to persecute us. What do we do? What's our response? I'm going to let them hear a piece of my mind. No, I'm, I need to let them hear about Jesus Christ. Because they need Jesus. There's a shirt that I see that people will wear every once in a while that will say, y'all need Jesus. Right? I like that, but you know what would be better? Y'all, 
I need Jesus. We don't need to start going to people like, hey, you need some fixing. Well, I do too. We all do. And what we have to do is make sure that we are not treating people like Jephthah was being treated. We got no need for you until we find maybe something that you could help us out with. Now, I want you to think about this in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Turn with me, if you would. See what the Apostle Paul says in regards to God's love for us. Amazing stuff. Those that hated Christ, those that spit on Christ, those that scourged Christ, and those that completely ridiculed and made fun of and mocked Christ, what was his response for them? What was, his, what was their value to him? So much that he was willing to go to that cross. Don't forget that when we're in this world and we're living in faith, hope, and love and people are trying to persecute us and people are trying to tamper with God's word and say God's not real. He is real and we're going to show him he's real because we're different people. We're not like the world. We don't retaliate. We love. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ones in the church, those really good moral character. No, for the ungodly. That's who he died for. For scarcely, for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he valued us so much that even in the midst of our sin and how evil and wicked we were living, he died for us and he loved us so much. And that's the value that we need to ascribe to people. That's the lens, the view that needs to come out of our eyes to people, not what can you do for me. But let me tell you about this Christ who rescued me. And he, he died for you too. Now I want you to consider this. That should be our value for men. But the value of our eyes for God should never change either. And here's the sad story of it. We talked about pointing our compass. Okay, and our compass points in one direction. And it, and it is pointed in one direction. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to do what God wants. And then that compass can slowly shift over time. We can never lose value of who God is. Now, I want to look at Peter real quick as our case study for this. Peter in Matthew chapter 16 was asked a question. Verse 13, they were in the region of Philippi. He said, who do you say that the Son of Man is? Now, some say, Jesus, some say that you're John the Baptist. I've heard people say that you're Elijah, maybe one of the other prophets. That's what I've heard, Jesus. I understand that, Peter. I understand that's what you've heard, but what, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? Well, I know you, I've been around you. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. What value did Peter ascribe to God? You are the Messiah. You are the king. You are my Lord. You are the one that we've been waiting for. You are the son of God. His value for, for, for Christ was that he was the Lord of his life. Now, does that change? Unfortunately, it does. Now, look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. Our value cannot change for who God is to us. Matthew chapter 26, and looking at verse 69. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying... You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know who you are talking about. Well, hold on now, Peter. Ten chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 16, you said, I know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. His value was exalted so high and now the game changes because there's some persecution coming. There's maybe some suffering coming. There's maybe some difficulty coming. And guess what? That value of who Christ was. No, I don't know him. I don't, I don't know. Who are you talking about? What are you talking about? Keep reading. Verse 71. And when they had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but again he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. 
Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know him. Value changes, does it not, when our circumstances of life change. 73, and a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he began to swear, and he said, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed as Jesus said, Peter, you're going to do this. No, Lord, I would never do this. Even if I got to die, it's not going to happen. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Situations of life change. I don't know who you are. Brethren, we have got to make sure that we value men, and that never changes. God went to the cross, Jesus Christ went to the cross for them, and we never change our value for our God, no matter what we're put in. No matter what fire comes, we cannot lose the direction of our compass. Point number two that we take from Jephthah is this. Our past doesn't have to control our future. Now, here's the circumstance that we see with poor Jephthah, son of a harlot, his background, my, my mother was a, was a harlot, was a prostitute. That's my past. That's where I came from. I had a family that rejected me and, and hated me, wanted nothing to do with me. That's my past. I had a past where I was banded together with wicked men, profane men, men that were worthless. And those were my guys. That was my crew. And we went together and we raided. That's what, that was my past. But his past didn't define him. When we think of Jephthah, we see him in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 in the hall of faith as mentioned as a man that was so important the Hebrew writer had to say, hey, I, I don't have the time to talk, but Jephthah, man, that's a faithful man. You see, his past, which he had one, and we all do, brethren, we all have a past, his past did not define his future where he ended up because he decided to follow God regardless of the cost. Now, I want you to think about Peter. Peter made a bad mistake, did he not? So do we. Maybe we've not been in that circumstance, but put yourself in that circumstance where your life may be on the line. Maybe now Peter doesn't seem like he's so weak, right? Peter's past mistakes didn't control his future either. You see, he made some bad ones, but he got back up like a prize fighter, like a heavyweight fighter who'd been knocked to the canvas, and he gets back up. We could look at Peter, and we could take the example of his life and his weaknesses or we could look at Peter and look at a man who has been knocked down so many times and he just keeps coming back. He may have denied Jesus before men in the past, but in Acts chapter 2, he declared something important. He's the Christ. He bounced back. How about us? Have you bounced back? How many of you have been knocked on the canvas? And the count's coming. And you're not getting up. Your past. If you got a past, it might hit you a little bit. I got a little bit of a past. Just keep getting up. And we see that in Jephthah, a man with some, with, with a past. And God saw something important in him. And he got up. Peter didn't stop there. In Acts chapter 10, he declared Jesus is Lord to the Gentiles. He's the son of God. I want you to think about 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So many times we want to preach this in the condemnation of the life that people are living. And the Bible is clear. 
There are standards in which we must live by if we're going to enter into eternal life. It's clear. 1 Corinthians 6 is clear. But you know what else is really clear? The redemptive capabilities of our Savior and what he can do regardless of our past. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as we start reading in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. The Bible says it. That's true. That's right. Preach it. Homosexuals, not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, you wicked people, you're not going to make it. Look at the next verse. And such were some of you. And such were some of you, brethren. The church at Corinth had these folks in it. The church at West End has these folks in it. The world is struggling with these things. And we can have a, a condemnation to our spirit or we can have a compassion to it that we want to help show them what Jesus has shown us. The hope that we have. The faith that we have in him and showing the love that we have in him by loving them. And not coming at them with some sort of a, how dare you get in this way? Don't you know how terrible your life is? Yes, their life's terrible and they know it. Know it. What they need is somebody to show them a little bit of compassion and a little bit of love and saying, I've got a better way. Your past doesn't have to define your future. We can make some change. Point number three, what we learn from Jephthah is this. Everybody needs a second chance. Now, this is an interesting situation because Jephthah is given a second chance, but in actuality, Jephthah didn't really do anything wrong, right? I mean, Jephthah, is, it's not his fault that his, who his mother and father were. He didn't do anything wrong to be drove out of his family. But nevertheless, he was given a second chance. Now, their motives for giving a second chance, it was because they could give him, they, he could give them something, he could help them. But here's what's more important in that story, was the second chance that Jephthah gave to them. Amen to that? Now, think about this, brethren. He's a mighty man of valor. He was ran out of his family. Now they're crawling to him saying, help us, please help us. I would have been tempted to say, you all put yourself in this position. Deal with it. Yes, I know I've got, I know I'm a mighty man of valor. I know I can handle this. But you know what? You made your bet. Sleep in it. How many people would say that? How many people say, I'm not coming back? But Jephthah was a man that was willing to give second chances. Well, what's interesting is we look into the New Testament and we just think about second chances. It's amazing to me to think about Peter and how many chances he was given, right? Let's just go through a few. Peter said to Jesus, you will, you will never wash my feet. He rebuked him, said, you're not going to do this. Jesus said, if I don't, you've got no part or portion with me. And he says, oh, my bad. That's right. Yeah, go ahead. Wash it in my head, too. Give him a second chance. Here's what else. Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus is shaking, shaking his head. Put that. Put the sword away. Peter, what are you doing? Then he puts the guy's ear back on. Peter sees Jesus walking on the water. Man, I want to do that. Lord, command me to come out there. He starts coming out there. Then what does he do? Loses some faith. I'm thinking, Lord, help me. That's me. Man, I'm Peter. I, I can see like the Lord just kind of shaking his head. Oh, Peter, I love you. Peter rebuked Jesus for saying that he would die. Jesus said, I got to go suffer. I got to go and I got to die. I, I've got to endure this. And Peter says, no, this will not happen. Where Jesus had to get stern with Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. 
Peter denied Christ, as we looked at three times. And then we also see Peter showing prejudice to the Gentiles. In the book of Galatians, chapter 2, whenever he preached to the Gentiles in Acts 10 and said, oh man, I get it now. It all makes sense. Light bulb, it clicked. Anybody who serves God and does it in every nation is welcome to him. And then what does he do in Galatians 2? The apostle Paul says he's playing the hypocrite. And other people were carried away like Barnabas because of his hypocrisy. Now, let's think about Matthew chapter 18. Who is the disciple that says, hey, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Peter. The one that's been forgiven so many times is the one that says, hey, I mean, how many times? This is ridiculous, right? Seven? Seven times? Jesus' response is not up to 70. Seven, but seven, 70 times seven. So in other words, we don't keep account of it. Peter, do you want us to keep account of yours? Nope. Everybody needs a second chance. And we're not just people of second chances, brethren. We're people of 70 times 7 chances. That's who we are. And why do we do this? Go to Matthew chapter 6. Why do we do this? Why, is, why are we people that are so willing to forgive? It's pretty simple. We need forgiveness. We need it. So guess what we need to do for others? If we love our neighbor, if we love our brothers ourselves, and we know that I need forgiveness, guess what I need to start doing? Not keep an account of how many times a person has sinned against me. Let it go. Forgive. If somebody offends you, Matthew 18, you've got to go to them and say, hey, you've offended me. If you don't have the courage to go to them and say, you've done me wrong, if you don't have the courage to do that, then guess what your option is? Forgive. Get, and get over it. Otherwise, your option is Matthew 18. You need to go to them if they've offended you. Matthew chapter 6, look at verses 12. And forgive us our debts as... We forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I am a man that makes mistakes. You are people that make mistakes too. We are not in some sort of a, a position to start counting up tallies of how many times we've forgiven. Because I certainly don't want that to happen in my life on the day of judgment. But if you do not forgive, verse 15, men, their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You see, everybody needs a 70 times 7 chance. Point number four as we close our lesson is this. Jephthah shows us that honoring our vow to God requires a great sacrifice. A great sacrifice. Now, this is a difficult text to look at. For those of you that know this story, you know what I'm talking about. Getting into this is, this is a difficult thing to wrap your head around. So Jephthah says this in Judges 11, verse 30. Lord, if you give me victory, if you do this, whatever it is I see coming out of my tent, I will offer up as a burnt sacrifice to you, whatever it is. So what happens? Judges 11, verse 32, the Lord gives that victory. So now what happens? Judges 11, verse 34, his daughter was the first thing he saw. Okay. I made a vow. That's my daughter. And as the Bible says, it's his only child. Hmm. When he sees her in Judges 11, 35, he says, I'm miserable. I made a vow. I can't break it. I said, God, I'll do this. I can't go back now. Is Jephthah in Hebrews 11 for this? Possibly. I think that's a part of it. Of a man that made a vow. And was willing to stick to it. Now look at his daughter. Let's not miss this. Judges 11 verse 36 where the daughter says, 
Father, you made a vow to God. You have to do as you've said. Now, I'm going to be clear with you. I've got my reservations on this, and I'll explain why. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, talks about the Israelites, God telling the Israelites that they were told not to offer their children in the fire. Okay? So it appears to me that the nature of God would say, I don't want a human sacrifice to me. He's told the Israelites this. The text also indicates that when he, she says this to her father, guess what she asked for? Father, you need to do this, but if you could give me two months. I need two months. I need to go up into the mountains with my friends, and I need to wail or mourn my virginity. She goes up there for two months. She comes back, and then the Bible indicates that he kept his vow, that he said he would. And then it says that she did not know a man. Now, my question for you all this morning would be, what would the significance be of her being a virgin if she was going to die? Why would you want to go up into the mountains and mourn being a virgin, why would you not mourn the fact that you're about to die? Is it possible that Jephthah was giving his daughter in the service and the sacrifice of God as Hannah gave Eli? I mean, if we think about God's nature with Abraham as he's about to take the knife to Isaac, what does he do? No, 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 stop. With all of that, I'm going to give the precursor of this. I don't know. You, you probably are going to say, this preacher, this is the second or third time he's got up in the pulpit and said, I don't know. You're going to hear a lot more of that from this preacher. Because I'm not a know-it-all. There's a lot of things I don't know. But here's what I do know. And I'm going to preach this to you. Whatever happened, and I trust God whichever way it goes. Whatever happened in that circumstance, here's the lesson we learned from that. you got to honor what you say you're going to do to your God. And I know it was hard. He said, I'm miserable. Do we have that type of spirit within us like Jephthah that has made a vow to God and we're going to keep it whatever may come? Now, I want you to look at this real quick as we close. Go to Matthew chapter 26 as we go back to Peter. Matthew chapter 26, we go back to Peter, and we look at the response that he gave. And I want to build up Peter a little bit here in our eyes, as he should be. He's a man that made mistakes, so are all of us. Matthew 26, verse 31 through 35, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. That's not true. That's a vow he made. He stumbled. Okay? Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, Lord, if I've got to die, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. He made a vow to God. Now, brethren, we have all made a vow to God. We have all said, Jesus is the Son of God, and I am going to render my obedience and my submission to him. He is the king of my life. I no longer am, am my own. I am bought with a price. We made that vow. Are we honoring that vow? Well, here's the thing. Peter stumbled, but ultimately he honored that vow. Now look at John chapter 20 as we consider this. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Here's Jesus speaking to Peter after his resurrection. So Jesus has been crucified. What had Peter just done? Denied him three times. Didn't honor his vow. I'll never be made to stumble. John chapter 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, this is again after Christ had resurrected, he met him on the seashore. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Whew. 
See myself and Peter. The weak part. The weak part. Feed my lambs. He said to him again, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now look at verse 18. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Remember the vow he made? I'll die. I'll die for you. Verse 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had followed this, he said to him, follow me. Brethren, let's not miss the point this morning. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, pure and holy. Not being conformed to the pattern or the teachings of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we live in faith, hope, and love, we've got to be like Jephthah. We've got to value people. We've got to value God. We can't change and waver on our commitment. We've got to realize that we all have a past, but that does not have to define where we go in life and our future. And everybody needs a 70 times 7 chance system. We've got to honor our vow to God and require sacrifice. If you've not became a child of God, we want to encourage you to do that this morning so that you can live a life in faith, hope, and love a life where you are a living sacrifice to God, and a life where you're able to be a light in this world of darkness, which this world has always needed lights. But it seems like the world is needing it more and more as we go. And we need more people to be that for God. If you have any needs, we encourage you to come. As together we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey? Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways? Working for the Master, giving him the praise. Earnest in his vineyard, honoring his laws. Faithful to his counsel, watchful for his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love? Leading others to him, lifting prayers above. Courage, faithful servant, in his word we see. On our side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. In closing, let us sing number 134, Faith is the Victory, number 134, after which we'll be dismissed in prayer by Brother David Estes. As a reminder, there will be the ladies' song leading practice here, so gentlemen, let's egress as soon as we can. Number 134. <clears throat> 
Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we've had to come together and worship you in song and prayer and the message from Matt that he brought to us this morning. We thank you for Matt and his ability to bring the word to us in a simple way and way we can understand it. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that more and more people are feeling comfortable coming to worship services here with you. We, we pray that this trend continues and we pray that we can, we can look for opportunities to also bring in unbelievers. We pray that you be with us through this week. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.